Our scripture reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 1, or chapter 3, excuse me, verses 1 through 15, as we continue our study of our ancient foe and how the reality of Satan and his work in this world applies to the lives that we live and our need to actually take a stand in Christ Jesus and resist him firm in our faith. So Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. <clears throat> so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid himself from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. May we pray. Father, open our ears to hear your word this morning, and our hearts to receive, our minds to understand, and above our, all our wills, to put into practice that which we take away from your word as your spirit works in us this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So at the Christian high school that I attended, one of the assignments that we were given was to read through various books of the Bible, and as we read through them, we were to come up with a chapter title for every chapter in the book. And then we had to memorize the titles so that in theory, if somebody walked up to us 50 years later and said, Second Kings chapter 2, we could come back with Elijah caught up in a whirlwind, or if you prefer... Or e Elisha and the she-bears that ate the children, whatever title you gave to it. And I don't remember most of them. I wish I remembered more. I do remember that when we read through the book of Genesis, almost every single student in the class gave Genesis chapter 1 the title Creation. And that's true. Genesis chapter 1 is the, the story that tells us that God created the world. But it's also true that Genesis chapter 1 is the story of how God created the world. As I mentioned last Lord's Day, in the beginning, by the word of his power, God made the world of nothing and all things therein for himself within the space of six days and all very good. So it's about creation. But if you read a little bit closer, there's this phrase that just keeps popping up over and over again, 10 times in 31 verses to be precise, and God said, and God said, let there be light, and there was light in verse 3, and in verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters, in verse 9, and God said, and the same in verses 11, 14, 20, 24, 26, 28, and 29. You can check it out at home. And God said, and God said, and God said. Ten times in 24 verses, and God said. 
So Genesis 1 tells us that God created the world, but equally important is the story of how God created the world. He spoke, and things came into being. He commanded. And as the writer to the Hebrews says, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that were visible. Now, this was particularly significant to the people who originally received the book of Genesis. We ought not think of Genesis as some kind of oral history of the primeval world. The book of Genesis came through Moses to the people of Israel, and it came after the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. So this expression, and God said, was particularly significant to them because they had recently stood at the foot of the mountain in Exodus chapter 20 when God spoke all these words and said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. If you think that the law of God would have been powerful as mediated through a man like Moses, we can only imagine that it would be given even more credence by a people who truly understand that this law was the word of the one who gives life to the dead and calls into being by his word the things that do not exist. I also find it interesting that in the creation account from Genesis 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 3, the Hebrew word that is translated God is simply Elohim, the same Hebrew word that is translated God consistently throughout the Old Testament. But beginning in chapter 2, verse 4, where we begin to see the God who created the world interacting more closely with his people, there's a shift to a different expression. In chapter 2, verse 4, it changes to Yahweh Elohim, translated the Lord God. And that's used then through the rest of Genesis chapter 2. How powerful this would have been to people who had recently heard God speak in an audible voice, saying, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. I am the Lord, your God. They now know that it was the Lord God who created the world, and it was the Lord God who made humanity in his own image from the dust of the ground. They know that it is God who made all things, and if he can create out of nothing then it should go without saying that he has the right to speak into our lives and to say, you shall have no other gods before me. He has the right to require that the world that he made, that the people that he created would worship him alone. Thinking about it, if I had it to do over again, and thankfully I do not, I would go out on a limb and I would give Genesis 1 a little different title. I think I would call it, And God Said, or maybe God Has Spoken, because that seems to be the main point of the chapter, really. Of course, verse 31 might do as well. After speaking everything into existence by the word of his power, God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And of course it was. Because when God speaks powerfully, creating the world ex nihilo, that is, creating out of nothing, then it is all very good. That should go without saying. It should also be mentioned that after the Lord God created Adam in his own image, one of the first tasks given to the man involved speaking. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he, the man, Adam, would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was its name. So one of the first tasks given to Adam was to speak into the world that God made and to name the creatures. And then in verse 23, and I believe verse 24 as well, we see Adam, that image bearer of the Lord God, speaking again in his capacity as the steward of all creation and establishing the covenant of marriage. Verse 23, Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Now most translations break the quotation at that point, but of course in Hebrew there are no quotation marks. Um, there's no indication of what was Adam speaking and what was Moses writing down God's word as it was inspired to him. And I think that Adam may well have gone on in verse 23. 
or 24, it may have been Adam who said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And it doesn't really matter if Adam said it or if God said it. If we were looking for a foundation laying biblical theology of human sexuality and marriage, there you have it. Whether verse 24 was spoken by Adam as the steward of all creation or by the Lord God himself, it was given to Moses eventually by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And as it says in Article 3 of the Belgic Confession, we confess that this word of God was not sent nor delivered by the will of man, but that holy men of God spoke being moved by the Holy Spirit, as Peter says, Afterwards, our God, because of the special care he has for us and for our, our salvation, commanded his servants, the prophets and apostles, to commit this revealed word to writing. Therefore, we call such writings holy and divine scriptures. Further, we confess in Article 7 of the Belgic Confession, this holy scripture contains the will of God completely, and that everything one must believe to be saved is sufficiently taught in it. In fact, the entire manner of service which God requires of us is described in it at great length. That is our confession. As Reformed Christians, the authority of Scripture is not limited to the salvation parts. It's not just those bits in the gospel that call us to repent of our sin and trust in Christ Jesus that speak authoritatively into our lives. The Word of God speaks authoritatively to the entire manner of service which God requires of us. The living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them has spoken. And as it says in the Westminster Catechism, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added. Now that takes on a special significance in our text this morning because in Genesis chapter 1, God spoke. And in Genesis chapter 2, Adam, the steward appointed by God over all creation, spoke. But in chapter 3, we are introduced for the very first time in Scripture to our ancient foe, the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan. And note how he makes his first appearance. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said, he spoke. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? I want you to remember, if you have your Bible open, look back to um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Or it's uh, actually there on the screen. The Lord God commanded. And that's a different Hebrew word. The Lord God, Yahweh, Elohim commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent speaks and he questions that command, and the way that he questions the command pushes the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, into the distance. Satan comes back using only the term Elohim. The serpent said to the woman, did God actually say, not the Lord God? Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Also notice, did God actually say, just say? Not did the Lord God command, but did God say? Now, that may not seem like a really big deal, but there are different words used in this narrative in the Hebrew text. And I think it kind of reflects the attitude of Hector Barbosa, of all the authorities I could quote, in, in, in Pirates of the Caribbean, where he said, the code is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. So Satan takes the command of the living God given to the man and his wife, and he says, you know, did that Elohim, that, that God fella, 
Did he suggest? Did he say you shouldn't eat of the tree? Furthermore, Eve then comes back. And instead of coming back in the language that the Lord God had used when he spoke to them, she echoes the serpent's language, both in her name for God and for the nature of the command. She replies, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God, again, not the Lord God, not Yahweh Elohim, said, not commanded, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So already Eve has distanced God. He is not the Lord God. He is not Yahweh Elohim. He is not that personal God who has been walking with her and with Adam in the garden in the cool of the day. He's just God. And his commandment has become more of a guideline. And then Satan takes that opening. The serpent comes in to just flat out deny the word spoken, the commandment given by the Lord God. You will not surely die, Satan says. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And it's at that point that Eve starts thinking. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul was describing in Romans chapter 1 when he said, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This was the fall of man. They couldn't say that they didn't know God. They did. They couldn't say that they had been given a subpar environment. They lived in the perfect environment. He walked with them in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day. They knew him. They knew his name. He was Yahweh, Elohim. They just didn't honor him as God. Instead of the God that they knew personally, they made this intellectual construct of the Lord God and they pushed him into the distance. They started doing what so many people today do. Well, I don't think God <coughs> would be like that. My God would certainly never judge someone for some tiny little sin they wondered if their God, in fact, might really be lying to them and denying them joy, satisfaction, beauty, and knowledge. It's like they were thinking, surely a loving God wouldn't deny us all the best that this world has to offer, and if he would, then who needs him? We don't want a God like that. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking. And I believe even before they took the first bite, their foolish hearts were darkened. The thing is, they didn't reach that point without help. The dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, pushed them along with the very same simple strategy that he has been using all along. Satan is really sort of a one-trick pony. He came to Adam and Eve, and he comes to us in the very same way. Did God actually say? Did God really? Did God actually say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God actually say, male and female? He created them? Did God actually say, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh? No lesser light than the inimitable Mick Jagger, if there actually could be a lesser light than Mick Jagger, wrote something of this in his song, Sympathy for the Devil. Pleased to meet you, the devil says. Hope you guessed my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. But it shouldn't 
puzzle us. Not at all. Now, as always, our ancient foe questions and twists the word, the command of the living God. And he does it until we begin to question it. He misquotes scripture. That's what he did in the temptation of Jesus. We'll be seeing more of that in weeks to come. He comes to Jesus and says, hey, you're hungry. Command that these stones be made bread. Jesus comes back with scripture and says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Or no, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then Satan quotes scripture back at Jesus. He just quotes it out of context and he twists it, trying to get Jesus and trying to get us to question what we know to be the truth by distorting what God has actually said. And then when we get to that point where we start to accept that twisted version of scripture, he comes along and he just denies it outright. You will not surely die. You will be as gods. And as I said a while back, that is the lie of every false religion from the Canaanite religions of ancient Palestine to the secularism of our day. You will be as gods. You will be the captain of your soul and the master of your fate. You will be in charge of your own lives. And of course, it was an empty promise. It was a promise that was made by the father of lies, and it has always been an empty promise. But God had said, God had commanded, in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die, and they surely did. Because Satan can't keep his promises. His promises are lies, but God always keeps his promises. As the psalmist wrote, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. So the promise that we need to see, the promise that we need to believe from Genesis 3 is not the word of the serpent. You shall be as gods, even though that's the one that gets all the headlines these days. Rather, it's the promise of God found in verses 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, we're back to Yahweh Elohim here. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The, the Hebrew word there for bruise is, is to grasp. It's saying the offspring of the woman will grasp and crush the head, the rosh, the authority of the serpent. And the best the serpent will be able to do is just nip at the heels of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the offspring of the woman. He... Jesus Christ shall bruise your, Satan's, head, and you shall bruise his heel. It's called the Proto-Evangelium. And it's the first promise found in Scripture of the coming of the Redeemer. In the very moment of humanity's fall, a fall that consisted of listening to the adversary's voice, listening to Satan's word and rejecting the word of God, the Lord spoke again. He spoke once more, promising life to the dead and calling things that did not exist as though they did. At the very moment that it seemed like sin and rebellion and darkness were going to overwhelm God's good creation, grace abounded still more. Because God did not leave us to the word of the serpent. The Lord God spoke. We'll be seeing this a lot as we go through this series. Satan always questions, did God really say? And God comes back and speaks truth into our lives. As I close this morning, just consider that that strategy remains the same. Satan always questions and then denies the word of God. And the needed response remains the same too. In his magnificent description of the believer's armor in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul began with, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. 
the first piece of armor that we need if we are to stand firm, resisting Satan in our faith, is the belt of truth. The first piece of armor to stand against his schemes is truth. And as the psalmist declared, the sum of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Jesus also prayed, sanctify them, sanctify us, his people. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So what do we do if we are to stand against the schemes of the adversary? We must stand in Christ himself. We must stand in the living word of God, believing in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead and confessing with our mouths that he is Lord. The word, the living word, the logos of God is Lord. And finding deliverance and salvation in him alone. And then we must be wrapped the belt of truth. We must be surrounded with the truth of God's word. Isn't this what we found in last week's text? 1 Peter 5, verses 8 through 11. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to this eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. And as we did last Sunday, I think we can end that together. All God's people said, Amen. Let's pray. Father, you have spoken, and when you speak, it comes to pass. You have sent forth your word, and when you send it out, it does not return to you empty, but it accomplishes the purpose for which you have ordained it. You spoke this world into existence, Father, through Jesus Christ, your living word. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And you have spoken us into your family calling us effectually by the word of the gospel and through your Holy Spirit to turn away from sin and to trust in you, to acknowledge the lordship of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, as we go out from this place into your world this week to go out as those who are committed to living in the lordship of our Savior, committed to following him, laying down all of our sin and the weights that so easily hold us back, taking up our cross and walking in his footsteps. And Father, as we do, give us grace and mercy that even as we fight and stand and struggle and resist and sometimes fall ourselves, we may remember that someday you will yourself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us through our most holy faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. In his blessed name, amen.